Well, good morning. Thank you for being here, and I'm honored to speak. If I can figure out how the remote works, that's me. As you know, I'll get into it in a second. The coroner's office in Ohio is an elected position, so I have to show my name on like 5,000 slides. So if anyone is in Montgomery County, we'll remember it in the voting booth uh, next time. So just quickly going to go over the coroner's office quickly from Ohio and then go through our numbers. Um, this is the third year I've been here. So just to show the trends, um, some of them you have already seen uh, from the last speaker. But so I'm, I'm going to add in what the crime lab's seeing, just to add some more, some more data for what's being taken off the street. Um, some talk about where the medical examiner coroner's office has created some intervention points, and then um, how we've had to change our processes, policies to sort of adjust to the workload that we're facing. And then a little bit about you know, what is an overdose and what we've learned in the last couple of years that we really don't know <laughs> from postmortem toxicology. Um, there's a big trend right now to quit doing concentrations because we, we don't know what they mean in a postmortem setting. So what's the coroner's office? We're the what happened people, not the who done it. If you've watched any television shows where you know, they show us running around arresting people and with our sidearms and everything, that's not, we don't do that. Um, we try to though figure out what happened in the law enforcement the prosecutor's office, other folks determine what or who actually did anything that might be criminal. We all obviously work as a team. Our work as a forensic pathologist is no different than your practice. You have to talk to the patient first. Our history, though, often comes from law enforcement or from family members. So we don't have that interaction. So we're interacting with a group of people to get our clinical information. So coroners and medical examiners, that's the two system for forensic pathologists. And coroners are typically elected. In Ohio, it is the only place in the country where you have to be an MD or DO, which gives it some advantage and some more similarity to a medical examiner system. Um, other states, for instance, Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, have lay coroners. So basically, anyone that's a non-felon, 18 years old, can run and be the coroner, certified death certificates. Um, Kentucky is unique in the bottom right there that they have a state medical examiner system that, over, that basically provides services to the elected coroner which adds a, a little bit of layer of science. Um, because of the way the system was created in England, the coroner can arrest the sheriff. It's kind of fun to be able to do that. Uh, it actually was changed in Ohio in 1968, but I haven't told our sheriff yet. He just, uh, it's a, to try to I keep it in my pocket. What's unique is in Ohio, there's every county has three commissioners. There's a couple charter counties that don't have the same system, but there's three commissioners each county. The coroner actually becomes the backup commissioner if two are absent, so the county can still function. Because the original word was crowner, crowners were a direct line outside of the sheriff to the king in the English system, so that's how the coroner became a, a higher sort of tier political official when it came over to this country. This is our, uh, whoops, fine building here, where's the, this is where I get to practice. If you watch television shows, they get to go to these cool places and hang out on the beach. This is the pretty people on TV and then my folks here in their, in their laboratory get up. But, so this is a map of what Montgomery County covered through the coroner's office in mid-2017. So obviously Montgomery County in red, we cover all that population. What happened in 17 with the overdose were late in 16 into 17, Cuyahoga County, which is also a regional center, was overloaded and they quit doing other people's cases. So they told other counties, look, we're not, we can't do any more overdoses from your county. So that's how I picked up Richland County. To, they came over to Warren County, I mean to Montgomery County. This is my current map of coverage. So in my ever attempt to take over the state of Ohio, <coughs> I continue to grow covering all these counties. What's happened is the big cities, Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland have gotten <coughs> overrun with their workload and lost staff. So there's only about 500 board certified forensic pathologists in the country. There's about 40 or 50 in the state of Ohio. I have eight of them in Montgomery County. Columbus at one time was down to two. Uh, Cincinnati is down to three. Cuyahoga has a, has a decent staff, but Franklin County is now re-tooled. Um, they're, they're back to fully staffed, but over time, people have left our coroner's office in Ohio, which has created a need and a shift um, to, to why they've come over to Montgomery County. So this is our 2018 summary with 6,000 death reports. We took 2,500 cases, did 2,000 autopsies, roughly 2,100 autopsies. In 17, we're about 2,400 autopsies as, as an example. In 19, we're on a pace to do that 2,400 again, 
<clears throat> excuse me, but it's not related to the overdose increase. It's just because of that size, more volume, more county sending cases into our office. This is one of the original maps from 2015. The red obviously is greater opioid overdoses, showing that Ohio was right in the mix in, as of 15. We were the number one in 15 with synthetic opioids, so the fentanyls and the fentanyl analogs uh, as they began to grow. So the original <clears throat> sort of epidemic back in the 70s, heroin, and then we went through the Miami Vice days, the crack cocaine, and then we hit the opioid um, spike up the chain into 2011. <clears throat> Just a quick example, and last speaker talked about it, the prescribing practices. So this is from the ORS report from 2013, and I put it in there to show these are Medicare recipients, and it's the dots, the black dots, if you can see them, are highlighting the top 25 Medicare opioid pres providers, prescription writers in the state of Ohio, and I have nine of them, well, really 11 if you count these two, that, er that I catch those overdose cases. So nearly half the providers who are the top opioid prescribers to Medicare feed into my office for overdoses, or the population. It's also in the Medicaid population. This was done in July, of, or published in July of 18, just showing some extreme use and prescribing practices where in the Medicaid population, 5,000 beneficiaries were at high risk receiving large volumes of opioids without what they considered anyways a matching diagnosis. Um, and so the higher counties there. When you're number one in anything, I like to point it out. So this was 2014 data. This is the National Forensic Laboratory Identification System. You know, we were the number one state by twice as much of, for fentanyl seizures. So state patrol on the highway, um, and this year they were getting semis and finding huge dose masses, quantities of shipped fentanyl across the state. Um, so this was sort of already shown, but it just, it just highlights from a visual perspective the opioid deaths as they changed over time from 2010 the, as the darker colors the more and more deaths were occurring across the state to 2016 is in the lower right and this is just he already showed this map but uh, the 2017 totals where again that's all along the river is my catch air cases come to Montgomery County he talked about not only overdose deaths, but overdose in general, ER emissions. So this is just a graph, and I know it's busy. I'm gonna have some highlight points to highlight here. Um, so it's the beginning 2016 to first quarter 2018. Dayton, Ohio matches in 2000 ER emissions, quarter one, 2000 ER emissions, quarter two. Those are higher than Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati, gross total. Dayton's 120,000 people versus a million people, and we had more ER emissions than they do. Here's the county populations where Cuyahoga's 1.2 million, Franklin's 1.1 million, Montgomery County's 500,000. Still, the end of 2017 and 18, more ER emissions as a gross number, so not a population adjusted. We're half the size with more ER emissions for overdoses which created a community in crisis. He showed some of these pictures. Um, so we, this be, we got a lot of national attention, as he said. I put these magazine covers, because I'm gonna show you just a quick, some pictures out of these articles. They're not de-identified because they've already been published in these articles. But this was what, in 2017, he showed one of the clip that had me interview. I've never, I've never allowed press into the morgue before, into the cooler space, but in the mid, Probably March, April of 2017, I started to do that because I didn't know what we were going to do and we needed more national attention, and that got it when people started seeing the operation from the morgue perspective. This is just one of the pictures as they rode along. We, we were constantly moving fast food restaurant bathrooms, hotels, and obviously the, a lot of the articles were about limited space in the mortuary. I could hold about 36 remains in, the, in my space that we've changed and restructured about 48 now. It affected anyone and everybody in the community. Resources are being strapped. EMS was running. There actually was a, a Dayton PD sergeant that would just ride around and restock people with Narcan in mid-2017. Um, Families were in crisis. In mid-early 2017, we didn't know where to go. The co team was just establishing. Treatment options are so much better now. Uh, people have resources. He talked about the GROW program, which is getting recovery operations working. Dayton PD sort of spearheads that. 
um, social worker, police, and um, other public health educators will go to wherever there's an overdose and they'll go down the whole block handing out information, talking to people, getting recovery assets uh, into the community. So he showed a little bit of this graph. We ended, the, this is county, Montgomery County only, 566 overdose. And he mentioned the weekly totals, which he showed, the monthly totals. The end of 16, and this is May of 2017, 81 deaths just in that one month. That's when we begin to say, I begin to say, you know, we are, we are the, you know, the, this is a mass casualty event. Uh, we're the overdose capital of the world because if you keep that curve going, we would have been. I can tell you from my perspective why it dropped, and I'll show you the numbers. Here's where we are now, staying low. We're, we're about one a day now, back up to one a day. So it looks like we're going to stay 30 all the way out for the year, which will put us right near our 2018 total. <clears throat> but here's what happened in Dayton, Ohio, carfentanyl. So it came on, and this is that May, so April and May. These numbers don't match because this is system-wide. This is every county we covered, what I showed before, the 81 deaths was just Montgomery County. But carfentanyl hit, and then it went away. Fentanyl analogs hit, and then they went away in Dayton, Ohio. Not gone, but their percentage dropped dramatically. And that's why the deaths have dropped dramatically. What kind of fentanyl analogs do we see? Carfentanyl, acrofentanyl, fentanyl, furanyl fentanyl, acryl, acetyl fentanyl. But it changes from month to month. One will be high, the next one will be high. It's just whatever, whatever product was delivered to the streets is what we see in the overdoses. We currently test for about 38, 40 different fentanyls in our screen. We have the capacity to quickly ramp up to test about 20 more. We have the controls already available. If the crime lab finds it on the street, we'll start testing it in the overdose population to see if we can find it. So what is the Montgomery County numbers? Uh, male, white men is mostly the um, demographic, although it, it, no one's excluded as that quote said earlier. Um, middle age group, they tend to be more single than married, although I don't know if that's a product of the addiction you know, process. I wanna point out that 92% of our deaths had opioids as an example, and then Two thirds, sixty percent, seventy percent of those are fentanyl overdoses in that in 2017. But I want you to remember that number, 92 percent. Of that two thirds, sixty to seventy percent that are fentanyl, one third of those have multiple fentanyl analogs. So not only did they have fentanyl, they had carfentanyl, they had acrofentanyl, they had butyryl fentanyl um, within the decedent. Why is that? This is a graph from the crime lab data. So these are samples law enforcement has recovered. And probably 80%, if you take from one, this is one drug found in the sample to greater than 10 drugs found in the sample, probably 80% of what the crime lab tests have multiple fentanyls, multiple drug products in one sample of powder, cocaine, meth, fentanyl, is all mixed into one powder sample. So it's reflected in the decedents of having multiple analogs within them. So prescription over of deaths by year, obviously, as we talked about, have gone down. But what's interesting is the percentage is 92%. So even back in 2010, we only had 117 opioid overdoses, but, or 117 opioids, 117 overdoses. 92% of those, even in 2010, were an opioid. The percentage has remained essentially unchanged. We just missed, we just missed that it was opioids back then as far as a crisis. It was coming. We missed it. 92% of deaths, have all, it's always been opioids. This is the graph showing fentanyl going up over time. Heroin's come down over time. Cocaine is now spiking, which is, he talked about African American population, the numbers are going up. Our data, it less reflects that, but some people believe it's because the cocaine is now being mixed with the opioid analogs. Here's our problem right now in Dayton, Ohio, methamphetamine. It's skyrocketing um, as far as being involved in the deaths. This is 2019. This is a relatively old slide. We're probably gonna be greater than 230 overdose deaths now, which you know, from just 16, we had 47. It's a dramatic rise in the amount of meth usage. 
Um, somebody mentioned gabapentin. We are seeing gabapentin. Um, this is from 17, nine percent of the deaths um, had gabapentin on board. Uh, but we're seeing whether you're going to whether we relate it to the cause of death or not. I tend to be a grouper and put drugs on if they're there. Um, but we see gabapentin all the time in the decedents. This is data hard to read. I'll highlight it from the crime lab. Uh, for, this is 2012 through 2018. The one on the left is heroin. You can see even from the, these are products um, that law enforcement has confiscated from a scene or from an overdose scene. Heroin has dropped. Cocaine has made, maintained relatively stable. THC has actually gone down. Fentanyl has dramatically increased. Meth has dramatically increased from what's being taken off the streets. Um, the end is carfentanil, so it has that blip from 2017, and then it's essentially vanished. It is back. We've had, in the last few weeks, Richland County has, has had a couple of carfentanil overdoses. We've had a couple of carfentanil overdoses. So it seems to be carfentanil has been delivered back into the communities. So this is the 2018, just to be a little more specific, it's um, methamphetamine is the driver from 2017, 2018. Some benzos are up, uh, tramadol's up. Uh, this is showing first quarter of 19. Opioids on the left, methamphetamine is here, which is showing some of the, the current uh, trends. In the first quarter of 19, they've had seven different opioid analogs taken off the street and identified in the chemistry lab. Three new designer benzodiazepines, first time we've seen them uh, through the crime lab. The submissions of food products with THC on board has dramatically increased through the crime lab. Um, and other vaping materials that contain high concentrations of THC have been submitted. So the crime lab, that's the opioid analogs, just from 16 to 17, you see the dramatic spike of the analogs and then how it went away from, from the overdose death perspective, that's why, one of the reasons why the opioid deaths are down, because those powerful analogs are not on the street as much. Uh, carfentanil, and then it disappeared. Methamphetamine, again, showing that spike through the crime lab samples. <clears throat> Some other things we've seen, we hadn't seen until 2018. Uh, this is a normal Oxycontin pill. This is a fentanyl pill. It's counterfeited. So they just take a stamp, fentanyl powder, it looks just like an Oxycontin pill. Obviously much stronger, capable of causing overdoses. This is, looks like an ecstasy tablet. It's fentanyl. It's all fentanyl. We're seeing a lot more edible material with THC. This is a large sample of a synthetic cannabinoid that the people are getting and then dissolving it in acetone and spraying it on um, marijuana leaves. So they're getting the synthetic product delivered through an inhalant, put on very powerful synthetic opioid, or THC. And this is a gummy bear with THC. So the overdose death investigations, this is obviously a lot of what we see with the needle use, needle tracks. In 2013, across the state of Ohio, they created, before the COAT teams, these poison death review committees. And it really was driven by the medical examiner and coroner community to try to find points we could intervene. And it was really the start of the Dawn program, you mentioned quickly, but the delivery of um, naloxone to the streets, because we realized that 70% of our opioid overdoses at that time were in the proximity of other people. And 25%, well, 50% of those people next door or with the person was not using heroin. So if we could get the antidote to those 50%, we could save lives. And that's where the origin of the Dawn Project came from examining coroners and medical examiners' data. By looking at the ORS reports, we realized that 70% of the heroin overdose deaths had a file in ORS, and they had been given um, legal prescriptions within three to four years of dying from their heroin overdose. <coughs> 36% of the people qualified for doctor shopping, so they had seen five different providers in one year. It's only a two-year look-back period. So it was clear that in our population then of heroin overdoses, most of them were still receiving or had recently received an opioid prescription. So it was an avenue to intervene. 
We also realized that most is probably self-evident, but had been um, to some version of a treatment facility or had been incarcerated. So they had interactions with law enforcement. So that was also one of the impetuses for the COAT team to be able to get to law enforcement and make an educational opportunity. As you talked about, people who are in jail or they go off their, um, their depot form and then they overdose because they've they're lost their tolerance. They've been in jail for a month. They come out of jail and they go right back to the street using heroin. So we really began to intervene in our jail populations. They got pamphlets about being released. Hey, you, you're not, you've lost your tolerance, be careful, those kind of interventions. So in Montgomery County, our data showed we have 95% of our deaths in 17 had some law enforcement contact. In it to 20% had um, drug charges, 40% just recently released from jail or within one year. Even to the point that 10% of the deaths had just been in jail the week before, or just released from jail. So we do it along with those kind of intervention data points. We we map a lot of so these sort of dots are hot spots with volume by zip code or location of incident, and then public health uses this kind of data to where they're going to put their ed educational efforts. So people will go into this zip code, they'll go into neighborhoods based on these volume mapping that we do, density mapping um, from overdoses. And he's talked about the, the COAT team. The Poison Death Review has now been in law. It's, it's Ohio law now. We have to participate in that. The GROW team we talked about. The sheriff has a front door program, front porch program, which basically operates just like the GROW team. And then there's been the crisis intervention programs. Inpatient treatment is now available 24-7. There used to be four beds. There's now, I think, 30-some. Just a phone call is available. There's four or five different outpatient opportunities. Uh, Somebody calls at 2 in the morning and wants help, they can get it now in Montgomery County, where two years ago that wasn't available, 8 to 5. <clears throat> so a little bit about uh, death investigations, just what, what challenges did we see in that process? Uh, instrumentation, obviously personnel was a problem, funding was a problem. Um, and as I talked about, we're less confident in interpreting postmortem toxicology now. There's no rules, and it's really been determine that this is really the model we need to do with death investigation with trying to interpret these opioid deaths. Um, you need the toxicology, obviously, but you need the autopsy or some morphologic information. Some of it can be gathered. There's research going on by using CT scanners, MRIs, just without having to do a full autopsy. And then you need the scene investigated. <clears throat> Many of our cases have been solved because our tox cannot find what's in the person in the blood but chemistry can find it from the scene. So we collect everything, any powder, syringes, spoons, <coughs> excuse me, and then chemistry can analyze that and we find what's in that powder, then we can target it in the bloodstream. So what's wrong with tox only cases? This is because of the workload. Many jurisdictions across the country have gone to, hey, we believe that's an overdose, let's just draw blood, call it a day. Because it's quick, it's cheaper, but they take a blood with a syringe, and where do they draw that blood from with the syringe? Into the heart, typically. Sometimes they'll try to get peripheral blood. <clears throat> but this article, most of that blood often has gastric material in it. So you're clearly not even in a vessel. What does that sample mean if I just drew up half a gastric contents with the blood I'm getting? So it, it's not interpretable results. So I do full autopsies. We actually clamp peripheral vessels look at the vessel we're sticking the needle into to draw blood with. And then there's some other, if we're going to call an overdose death, <clears throat> or if that overdose death is going to end a legal prosecution for the dealer, how do I know they didn't have a PE? A heroin, can, a heroin user with tolerance, what concentration kills them? I can strangle an overdose, a, an, an addict person, and if I'm doing tox only, I'll never see that. I'll never know if they had a PE or a brain tumor, add value to the family because I detected some kind of accelerated atherosclerosis or something. So in my office, we do autopsies on all the cases. We've even proved that we're really not very good. We're not very sensitive or specific. So when we go to the scene and we go, I think that's an overdose, it's not very predictive if it's going to be a drug overdose or not once the tox comes back. <clears throat> Why is it also not good? These are numbers through the crime lab from Dayton, Ohio. 583 of our OVI cases and since the end of 2017 when we tracked it have fentanyl analogs to the point where 177 of those operating a vehicle on carfentanil. There's my colleagues in the country that say carfentanil equals you're dead. 
No, it's not. We just yet last week, fentanyl, 314. Last week we had an OVI case, walked into the hospital, signed the consent form. Her fentanyl's 50 nanograms per ml. Lethal's four to five, probably. So we have a tolerance problem in Dayton, Ohio, where people are actually up and awake on 50 nanograms per ml of fentanyl. But that's why numbers are not interpretable without the history, without the morphology from the autopsy. It really creates this kind of problem. It says, take this handkerchief back to the lab, Stevens. I want some answers on which monster it is. Godzilla, Gargantuan, of course, it's King Kong with the monogram. But that's, it's, there's so much noise in interpreting these cases that we have to really focus on what's important. <clears throat> Why is there noise? Because pharmacon pharmacokinetics is what we all look about and study. It's well tested in the pharma pharmacology industry. Toxicology is not because we can't get good volunteers to overdose and test what the drugs at certain levels do to someone. But how much drug does it take? What was the ingestion time? We can't do. Basically, postmortem toxicology is all done on experience and estimation. Well, they were dead, so that must have killed them. Route of administration changes. If you inject fentanyl, it's called the, I'm sure you guys know, the rapid um, log chest syndrome, but fentanyl was never meant to be injected into the vasculature. If you had, concentration rises quickly, the muscles become paralyzed and they basically asphyxiate at a very low concentration of fentanyl. Bioavailability, where's the site of action? Does it cross the blood barrier? How active does this drug, how active is this one drug? Single versus multiple doses, tolerance, all these things make interpreting toxicology a nightmare in a postmortem setting to the point that many boards are removing any references to lethal concentrations because we just don't know without looking at the whole story. This is a case example, 32 year old found unconscious behind the wheel. He had some THC in him, bisnolecanines, a cocaine metabolite, a really low level of fentanyl, huge carfentanyl level. Cause of death would be from those numbers? Well, it wouldn't be because he walked into the hospital, signed the consent form, you need the history to be able to interpret those numbers. This is a hit guy who had hypertension, ulcer, sciatica, had abused pain meds. He had just gotten a bottle of Percocet a week ago and it was now empty. So the logical conclusion is he's a Percocet overdose, move on. But he turned out to be a loperamide overdose. Oxycontin wasn't even detected. It takes huge doses, but basically an Imodium overdose because it creates opioid-like effects in high doses. So this is, we talked about those 566 deaths in Montgomery County. I wanted to show just a slide of our system-wide totals in 2017. This is about 1,200 overdoses um, that we handled in 2017. And that 1,200 overdoses caused a lot of process changes in our office. But just a little bit about that, we changed our equipment. This is called a uh, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, mass spectrometer. So they're running in a series. We can get to very low concentrations with this machine. We basically purchased two more. So now we could run everything on the LCMS. We piggybacked runs so that the runs could be done quicker and faster to get turnarounds faster. Um, we replaced our immuno screening. All on, so all our screening went to the triple quad, which was faster. It saved us money. because We don't have to buy the immuno screening um, kits anymore. We changed how we had to staff the morgue. Um, we standardized procedures, different techs would do things different ways. We standard it across the board so they could be interchangeable for different tasks. Um, do we change the same things in chemistry? We went all on to the mass spectrometer because we needed those low levels of drugs. We changed how we rush cases. So we do a rotation where our techs are on rush cases to grand jury cases to oldest cases. And they created this group email. So when a, the sheriff department court didn't have to call and interrupt technicians. They would just send an email and that one person on rush cases could monitor that email so we could get um, systems done. We, we allowed for remote access now so things could be signed out quicker. We had to change our morgue processes. We changed our timing, so different staffing levels. But it really, one of the advantages I wanted to get to is, as you saw, I cover that huge map. Montgomery County is the only um, payer for me that's general fund. So that dollars I get from Montgomery County doesn't change. Everybody else I bill. So as my workload volume went up, my revenue went up, and then I could afford to go get part-time people. In mid-2017, I had six part-time physicians. 
I had three or four part-time temporary technicians. We added three investigative staff, and I could only do that because I had a variable income source as the work went up. I just think this picture's funny, so it's my conclusion. These guys are all in masks, and this, I guarantee you this is the coroner, a medical examiner, standing there in the scene. <laughs>